Hello everybody, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. So now let's move on to the next affinity chromatography which is called as the metal affinity chromatography. That metal affinity chromatography falls within the category of the pseudo affinity chromatography where we have the di affinity chromatography as well as the metal affinity chromatography. So we have taken an example of nickel NTA affinity chromatography. And a nickel NDA chromatography technique has multiple steps. So what you have is you have the two different columns. One is called as the nickel NDA agarose columns and the other one is called as the nickel NDA sapphorose beads. When you buy this column or when you buy this uh, affinity chromatography from the vendors, you may have the two version. One is the agarose beads, other one is called as the sapphorose beads irrespective of these beads are not going to have the nickel or the transition metals bound to the matrix. So the first step is you are going to do the charging with the help of the nickel or zinc or the other, other transition metals. You will not going to utilize the iron because the iron is very reactive and iron is known to produce the hydrogen peroxide when it is being present in the uh, water. So, because the iron can go through with the multiple oxidation states, for example, iron can go from iron 3 to iron 2 and because of this oxidation reduction states of the iron, uh, it uh, normally processes the water and then it actually you convert the water into the hydrogen peroxide or the hydroxy radicals and all these hydrogen peroxide or the hydroxy radicals are bad for the protein what you are planning to purify because they will damage the protein. So that is why the iron is not being used in this chromatography technique but apart from the iron you are free to use the other affinity other transition metals like nickel, zinc or chromium. Uh, so the charging step you are going to add the metal solutions either the nickel or zinc or the chromium and that actually will go and bind to the NTA agarose beads and that is how you are going to develop the affinity column where the matrix is going to have the nickel bound and this nickel is going to have the extra coordination bonds available for the protein to bind which means this if all these are transition metals so they have the uh, multiple uh, uh, you know multiple valencies which are available. So few valencies are going to be used by the functional groups which are present onto the uh, NTA agarose beads or NTA sapphorose beads and the few coordination uh, valencies or bonds are going to be available for your protein to bind uh, with the help of the protein bound histidine tag which means the histidine is going to have the very high affinity or histidine tag is going to have the very high affinity for this metal bound transition metals whether it is nickel, zinc or chromium. So now what you do is you apply the sample which means you apply your cell lysate after that you are going to have a washing step so that you are going to remove the unwanted uh, proteins and uh, once you are done with that you are going to do the elution. So elution can be done uh, in a multiple ways and elution can be done with the counter ions. So in this case the counter ion is the histidine and uh, but ideally we do not use the histidine we use something else. So that anyway we are going to discuss when we will discuss these steps in more in details. After this you have to wash the column and to the regeneration of the column. So you remove the unwanted proteins by the washing and then you are going to do the elutions with the help of the counter ions. So ideally we should use the counter ions such as the histidine because the histidine tag is the is the ligand in this case which is for the nickel which is bound to the matrix. But the histidine is a very costly amino acids and that is why people do not use the histidine. Instead of histidine what they do is because the histidine is also contain the imidazolium ring. So instead of histidine what you can do is you can simply use the imidazole and the imidazole 
if you use the different concentration of the imidazole, you will be able to elute the proteins from the column. Apart from the imidazole, you can also use the EDTA because the, the metal is bound to the matrix by a coordinate linkages. So, there is no covalent linkages of the nickel to the matrix. So, if you add the small quantity of EDTA, for example, if you add the, um, the 20 millimolar EDTA, uh, you are going to remove the metal from the matrix. So, if you remove the metal from the matrix, subsequently the protein which is bound to the matrix is also going to be removed. EDTA is a chelating agent, it normally binds to the uh, metals and it has a very high affinity for the metal and that is why it can be able to remove the metal from the matrix. The third is uh, you can use the pH because the nickel NTA saffros or the chromatography is always being done above to the 8 pH because at this pH the histidine tag which is present onto the protein has the suitable, suitable charges and that is required for its, its to bind to the beach. So, if you lower the term, uh, pH to the less than 8 which means if you use the pH of 7 or 6 or even 4, you will be able to re, uh, reduce the in affinity of the histidine tag to the nickel which is bound to the matrix and as a result the, nickel, uh, the histidine bound protein or histidine tag containing protein is going to be removed from the column. Number 4 way of eluting the protein is that you can add the cryotropic salts like you can use the urea or GDMCL and that also is going to affect the affinity between the histidine tag versus the nickel NTA and that also is going to remove the, uh, the protein from the column. Number 5, uh, you can also use the beta mercaptoethanol or you can use the DTT. So, if you use the reducing agents, the reducing agents are also going to uh, interfere with the binding of the nickel to the matrix and as a result it is actually also going to allow you to uh, elute the protein from the column. The only thing what you have to remember is that the beta mercaptoethanol or the DTT are very harsh treatment. So, it may sometime destroy the uh, the NDA beats and as a result it may permanently cause the damage to the column. So, in, in those cases you might have to renature the uh, column back very quickly or you have to avoid utilizing the beta mercaptoethanol. So, with this uh, uh, we uh, since these are the theoretical explanation of how to perform the nickel NTA chromatography, I thought of taking you to my lab where the students are routinely been utilizing the nickel NTA affinity chromatography and they might be able to show you how to perform the nickel NTA chromatography and how to do all these different steps to do the purifications and how to analyze the purifications after the affinity columns and so on. And uh, so, in this demo the students have explained the running of the nickel NTA column with the uh, different steps. For uh, protein purification, uh, first we have to inoculate the culture uh, into this uh, larger volume of ELB plus, then uh, we will induce it. So, first I will show you how to inoculate. This is the single colony grown overnight culture. So, we can use for the uh, yeah, I inoculating into large cultures. So, this process should be done in aseptic condition. So, that means we have to use laminar air flow for this purpose. So, and also we have to remember uh, we, we should include uh, suitable uh, resistant marker like uh, ampicillin or uh, canamycin, this kind of antibiotics, or this is uh, depends upon what vector, what resistant vector you are, you are having. So, 
in this case we are using amoxicillin uh, as a antibiotic so let's start uh, we have lysed the cells using sonication now we have to centrifuge the lysate to get supernatant so that supernatant we load on to nucleate DA column and purify the protein so I will transfer into 50 ml centrifuge tube then red centrifuge uh, while the centrifugation is going on we have to wash the column using first this is in 20% uh, uh, ethanol so we have to wash first with water then uh, equilibration buffer so uh, let it drain completely the 20% ethanol then we will add water uh, double distilled water so at least 5 column volumes of water should be added to remove complete uh, completely and uh, next we will equilibrate with the lysis buffer the buffer which we used for the lysis of the bacterial cells before equilibration of the column uh, we have to uh, charge the column nickel NTA there are two types of bits are there one is already readily charged bits which comes from company and another one is we have to charge they will give only in uh, NTA agar was bits so here what we will do is we will charge the beads with the nickel and then we will equilibrate we already washed the column uh, with water and uh, 0.2 normal NaOH again with water so now we will equilibrate so this is a nickel hexachloride solution uh, So we will keep in the, this condition at least 20 minutes to charge the beads. After that, we will uh, remove uh, nickel NTA. We will elute the nickel uh, nickel solution and then uh, equilibrate with the lysis buffer. So after 20 minutes we eluted the uh, nickel solution, uh, next we will equilibrate with the lysis buffer. We have to wash at least two column volumes to remove any free nickel which exists in the beads. So after equilibration, next step we will load the uh, lysate and then incubate for binding. This is a farafin. Uh, I am going to close this in the pan. So once column packing is over, we have kept it in ice and uh, we will keep in this condition for at least 2 hours for binding. So that uh, his tagged uh, protein we will bind to the nickel NTA and uh, in further steps we will elute the protein. After incubation with weeds, uh, we have to follow another 3 steps. 
to get completely purification done. First step is we have to wash with the equilibration buffer. First, after uh, the beads taken out from uh, eyes, you have to you have to remove the outlet so that all the flow through other than beads will be taken out. And the next step is we have to wash with the equilibration buffer. And the third step is we have to uh, elude the sample, uh, elude the protein, uh, histamine protein using imidazole containing buffers. All for all these buffers, the pH should be adjusted prior hand. Not like uh, you have to first uh, you take uh, the buffer, uh, lysis buffer, and you have to add the imidazole. It's not like that. It may uh, increase the pH of the buffer. So after compiling all the uh, lysis buffer with the imidazole, then we have to adjust the pH so that throughout the procedure the pH won't change. So this is a flow through, whatever we are getting is flow through. Um, in next step we will wash with the uh, uh, lysis buffer. In this step we are going to wash with the uh, lysis buffer or equilibration buffer. So I just this is the license buffer. Uh, before doing this, we have to observe the beads. We should not directly load onto beads. You just have to uh, pour through corner uh, through the wall of the uh, column. Otherwise, it may disturb the. Uh, the beads so protein may also degrade so this we have to uh, keep in mind while doing this uh, washing while doing purification we have to remember that every time you are introducing new buffer you are introducing new buffer that time you have to collect the fraction and uh, this can be used for the uh, running SD spell and uh, testing the purity of the samples and also the flow through part and the washing part what we have collected we have to keep it safely after verification of the gel only we have to throw say you are getting only 10% of the protein in your uh, purified fractions and 90% of the protein eluting in the flow through that time you can reuse the uh, flow through for purification uh, purification again purifying the protein again so you have to collect the fractions in a small microcenter of tubes and we have to save those fractions David and save so we washed with the equilibration buffer and we also collected the flow through now it's time we will wash with the 20 millimole of imidazole. So this will remove any non-specific proteins binding to uh, the beads. So we will wash with the 20 millimole imidazole containing buffer. Then we will eluting subsequently eluting uh, 250 millimolar imidazole containing buffer.
in the final step we are going to help with the 250 millimol imidazole containing profile so what we are going to do is we have to incubate uh, beads with this buffer for some time and uh, collect the fractions After editing the complete fractions, we have to wash the column with water, then 0.2 normal sodium hydroxide solution, then uh, again water. After final wash with the water, then we have to store the beads in 20% ethanol. So I will wash it and store it in the ethanol. While the washing is going, going on, we have to take 50 microliter of each fraction and run it on uh, SDS phase. That will give the purity of the fractions. We have to heat the samples before loading onto SDS phase. And also, we have to keep this, all these fractions what we have collected at 4 degrees Celsius for further confirmation of the purity. Once the purity is confirmed, we have to dialyze those fractions against the, our buffer of interest, then use for the further studies.
So we purified uh, the protein using nickel FDA kanam. Uh, we run the gel and uh, stained or de stained. So now it's time to document the gel. So uh, we have to identify whether we got any uh, single band fraction or not. So this is the gel I kept on uh, white tray. Now just close it. So we have loaded a marker and uh, this uh, from this side. Second one is the load. This is flow through, wash one, wash two, and uh, these fractions are eluted fractions. One, two, three, four, five, serially. So as we can see, uh, the eluted fraction showing a band corresponding to uh, this protein, uh, but the molecular weight can be uh, calculated using the software image lab software so as we can see uh, in uh, the protein corresponding to this purification uh, his tagged one it is going most of the fraction in the uh, flow through so we can use uh, as i said in the video earlier we can use this flow through action again for purification of the protein you can incubate uh, this flow through with the same beads um, and you can uh, repurify again so that will increase the uh, uh, productivity getting the protein so these are all other bands whatever we are seeing in the protein uh, this uh, eluted bands those are because of the contaminants or uh, degraded protein contaminants sometimes may come because of uh, histidine two or three or four histidine having in folded state that will give uh, possibility to bind to nickel NDA column and also washing a vigorous washing should be done if you don't wash properly with a high amount of imidazole that will uh, give you this kind of non-specific binding so with this uh, uh, will conclude the video so i hope it will help you to uh, help you in your work for uh, during protein purification or uh, help you to understand uh, how protein purification works so in this demo we have uh, i think the student have explained each and every step in detail and i hope this could have been useful for you to understand the practical aspects of the chromatography techniques. So with this we would like to move on to address some of the uh, research problems related to the affinity chromatography. Uh, the first problem is where we uh, can use the affinity chromatography is that the mycobacterium tuberculosis H37 RV was treated with the drug anti TB drug and it causes the generation of the oxidative stress inside the bacterial cell. The ligand responsible for this effect was isolated and now the ligand responsible for this effect was isolated and now PhD student wants to identify the adapter protein from the mycobacterium tuberculosis to understand the signaling events and the associated molecular components. So what this question means is that if you are taking a mycobacterium cell, so mycobacterium tuberculosis is a bacterial species which causes the uh, TB into the human beings and if you treat it with the drug, so what will happen is that the mycobacterium tuberculosis is drugs are uh, see mycobacterium cells are developing very high quantity of oxidative stress which means oxidative stress means the cells are producing very large quantity of hydrogen peroxide, superoxide radicals, hydroxy radicals and all those kind of free radicals. So it is actually generating very high quantity of free radicals. So that actually is if you do not control the oxidative stress for a very long time then it is actually going to bring the death of the bacterium. So how it is happening? It is happening because when you are treating the MTB with the drug, it is actually producing a ligand 
and that ligand is binding to a receptor and that receptor is associated with the downstream protein molecule which are all uh, technically being called as the adapter protein and then these adapter proteins are taking the signal from the receptor and driving the reactions to the bacterium and so the question is how to identify these adapter proteins. Now in the experimental design if you want like to address these questions what is our issue is that a ligand is being produced which is bounding to this receptor and then the receptor is additionally binding to the adapter protein. So in the first step what you can do is you can generate a affinity column which actually contains the ligand which being coupled to the matrix and then what you do is you take out the bacterial lysate and incubate this whole complex with the, that. So what will happen is this bacterial lysate is going to bind the receptor or to the adapter proteins and then eventually you wash the column for some time and then it is actually going to give you the receptor as well as the adapter proteins. How to perform the reactions? So to perform this uh, experiments what you have to do is you have to do the recombinant DNA technology because you have to produce the ligand. Then you have to do the ligand production because recombinant DNA technology is going to give you the ligand productions. Then you have to couple the ligand to the matrix and once that is ready then you are going to prepare the lysate and uh, perform the affinity chromatography. Once the affinity chromatography is over then you have to perform the SDS page and SDS page is only going to give you the proteins what here are present. That protein can be identified by two methods either you do the mass spectrometry to identify these proteins or you can do the western blotting and that actually also going to give you the identity of these proteins because you can use the specific antibodies and that actually is going to give you the uh, proteins. So how to do that? Affinity chromatography can be used to study the uh, interacting partners of a particular protein. So in this approach matrix is incubated with the pure protein which means in this case the ligand and then washed to ensure tight binding. All other sites on the beat is blocked with a non-specific protein such as BSA and then you incubate with the cell lysate uh, which is actually going to bind to the protein A or the ligand and then you do the washing and then you do with elution with the salt and once you do the elution with the salt. Uh, it is actually going to come out from the column and then you can be able to see the pattern onto the SDS page. Once you see the pattern on the SDS page you can be able to purify or identify these proteins. Now the protein 1 is eluted from the matrix either by adding high size concentration of ligand or with a denaturating conditions. Once you do that you are going to see the pattern of the protein onto the SDS page. Uh, that eluted protein can be analyzed onto the SDS page and SDS page can be followed by the western blotting to detect the protein 1 and protein 2 as a control because you also need to understand that the non-specific experiments uh, experiment could have uh, some non-specific reaction as well. So you can be able to lysate you can just simply load the li cell lysate without the ligand or you can add the protein 2 with the added without the protein 1 to rule out the possibility of protein 2 binding directly to the matrix which means you have you can run the two control you can have the one control where the cell lysate is the bacterial cells are not being treated with the drug or number 2 where you do not have the you have the matrix but you do not have the ligand present onto the matrix. Either of these will actually going to give you the uh, uh, clear idea whether the protein what I am identifying or the adapter protein what I am identifying at the end are authentic or, the, or not. So this is the result what you are going to get and then you will be able to verify these results simply by running the control reactions. Now the research problem 
2, so the such problem 2 is there is a protease called PFI 1625C was cloned from Plasmodium falciparum 3D7 and the PhD student wants to identify the substrate peptide sequence to understand its role in parasite metabolism and to design the potent inhibitor. So in this case what is the problem is that you have a peptide sequence if you incubate this peptide sequence with the protease like PFI 1625C, the peptide is going to be broken down into the multiple pieces and what you could understand is that it is not non-specific, it is cutting at a very specific point. What are the specific point? So in a typical protease, when you have a cutting site, what you see is that the 4 amino acid on to the right side as well as the 4 amino acid on to the left side are actually be responsible for this protease to recognize the cutting side. And what the uh, person wants to identify is he wants to identify this particular sequence which is being recognized or which is being identified by the protease and then it is cutting. So he wants to know this sequence. So the sequence on to the uh, right side is known as the P1, P2, P3 and P4 sites whereas the sequence present on to the uh, left side is known as the P1 prime, P2 prime, P3 prime and P4 prime. So you want to know the P4 to P4 prime sequence for the protease PFI 1625C. Now what is the experimental design? In the experimental design you have to first produce the peptides and you have to couple it to the matrix. So if you do so and incubate these with the PFI 1625C, it is going to break this peptide into two fragments. So one fragment will go along with the peptide fragment, the other fragment which is also going to present along with the matrix site. So if you have a complete library of different peptide sequences where the one end is bound to the matrix, the other end is free. So the free end is actually going to be uh, washed away into the buffer whereas the bound form you can be able to recover. And if you can be able to sequence this particular bound peptide, you will be able to deduce the, the protease cutting sites. So for experimental uh, performance, what you have to do, first you have to produce the proteins, you also have to synthesize the peptide, different peptide sequences. So you have to actually generate a library. Uh, this library you can generate either in a de novo mate, which means you can just start with a, uh, with a scramble sequence and then you refine the sequences based on your finding or you can take the pre-existing library. Then you couple these peptides to the matrix. Once you done that, then you incubate these with the protease assay reactions and then you are going to do the affinity chromatography so that the matrix bound peptide is going to remain with you and then you are going to do the LCMS of this peptide to identify the peptide sequence. Uh, and that actually if you analyze all the peptide sequences from this library, you will be able to deduce the uh, peptide cutting sites for this particular protease. So in a typical thing what you have is you have a pe peptide sequence, then you have a matrix and then you have the different such peptides which are present in a 24 well dish. Then you treat it with the protease, what will happen is the this protease sequence is going to be chewed off by the protease and you are what is left over is the remaining peptide sequence, you can collect all these bead bound peptide, you can collect them, then you cut the peptides and then you do the multi. And what the multi is going to do is it is going to give you the masses of different peptides from uh, individual reactions and if you can interpret these masses, you will be able to know the sequences present in the each well because you know the peptide what is present. So what is remaining? that is actually you can be able to deduce from the masses and then you can reconstruct and that actually is going to give you the peptide protease cutting sites. 
Now, next move on to the research problem number three. So, in the research problem number three, the cancer patients are treated with the Ayurvedic medicines to improve its immune responses against infectious agent. Now, the doctor wants to measure the cytokine level in the blood of the particular patient to understand whether the Ayurvedic medicine is working or not. So, what is the experimental design? The experimental design is that you are actually going to generate the affinity column where you are actually going to have the antibodies coupled to the matrix against the particular cytokine or a, a series of cytokines. And then what you do is you take the cell lysate or the lymphocyte lysate from the patients, incubate it into the column and then you wash it and subsequently you can elute. So, when you wash the all other proteins are going to be removed except the cytokines which are actually binding to the antibodies present onto the matrix. So, what happen is that in the matrix you have the antibodies. So, this antibody is specific for a particular cytokine. So, what happen is that this partic that particular cytokine will go and bind to this matrix or you can have the combination of the antibodies. Then you what you do is you do the elution with the ligands, ultimately you are going to get the cytokines into, you can get the cytokines from this particular patient. And then what you can do is you can just measure the level of these cytokines with the help of the ELISA. So, the experimental, if you want to perform this experiment, the first thing what you have to do is you have to isolate the blood of that particular patient. Then from there you have to first prepare the serum. I think we have already discussed how to prepare the serum from the blood and then you have to do a affinity chromatography to identify the cytokines. So, that actually is going to give you the cytokines and once you have these cytokines purified from the serum, you can be able to identify or measure the individual cytokines with the help of the ELISA. So, in this what you can do is you can do a, a avidin biotin kind of system to capture and isolate the cytokine from the immune cells. So, biotin related antibodies allow the immobilization of the antibodies in the correct orientation onto the streptomycin, streptomycin coated glass beads. Uh, lymphocyte lysate is passed to the column packed with the glass beads containing antibodies bound uh, bind. Uh, pass through the glass bead containing antibodies bind cytokines. The cytokines are eluted by flowing the buffer of decreasing pH or by the cuotropic ions. The antibodies remain bound to the column due to the strong affinity which is resistant to these chemical treatment and ultimately you are going to get the cytokines. So, with this uh, we have discussed different chromatography techniques. We started with the basics of the chromatography techniques, then we discuss about the ion exchange chromatography uh, followed by the hydrophobic interaction chromatography, gel filtration chromatography and the uh, lastly we have discussed about the affinity chromatography. For the each chromatography technique we have, uh, we I tried to discuss the different types of research problems so that you will be able to Rec real realize the potentials of these affinity chromatography and you will be able to utilize this affinity chromatography for designing the experiments to solving the different types of experimental problems or by solving the different types of the such problems related to your work. So, with this I would like to conclude our lecture here. Thank you.